everyone. It's noon. Time to begin our bi-monthly Grand Rounds. Uh, we have two speakers today, uh, Lauren Boynton and Meg Carey. Uh, Meg is a second year child and adolescent fellow and a graduate of the University of Psychiatry uh, Residency. Uh, she explains to us that she entered the field of psychiatry primarily because of her interest in the phenomenon of resilience. That's really interesting. <laughs> all right, and I'm going to tell you about Lauren Boynton, who probably all of you know, but um, maybe you don't know of her many academic accomplishments. She graduated from Cape Town University Medical School and then worked in London for three years before coming to uh, the university in 1995 to specialize in psychiatry. She's an assistant professor in the department and has worked at Harborview since 1999. She's worked on the Community Psychiatry Leadership Track and the Faculty Integrative Health Program uh, of the Faculty Development Program. She's produced videotapes and DVD teaching project, products such as Spiritual Psychotherapist Panel Discussion, which is used in the didactic teaching of psychiatry <laughs> residents. Uh, she's produced uh, another production called of, well, Major Faith Traditions Panel Discussion, where video, this videotape very interestingly features clergy from five major religious traditions answering questions about how different aspects of mental health are viewed in their religion. Her national responsibilities include being a committee member on the Society for Study of Psychiatry and Culture. She's on the Program Planning Committee for the Society <coughs> for the Study of Psychiatry and Culture and the Integrative Mental Health Committee uh, for the Consortium of Academic Health Academic Healthcare Centers for Integrative Medicine. She's received in, nine, in 2002 the John Templeton Spirituality uh, and Medicine Award for Psychiatry Residency Training Programs. She's presented on refugee and international health issues locally, nationally, and internationally. Through her teaching and research, she strives to prepare the next generation of psychiatrists <laughs> to think comfortably about cultural expressions of mental distress and to discuss and treat it drawing on both psychiatric practice and community traditions and resources in American and international contexts. Okay, Lauren and Meg. <laughs> Black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Invictus, Latin for unconquered. The poet William Ernest Henley wrote it from his hospital bed in 1875. His indomitable spirit led him to triumph over the amputation of his leg. Mandela was an anti-apartheid activist and the leader of Nkontu Wisizwe, the armed wing of the African National Congress. In 1962, he was arrested and convicted of sabotage and other charges and sentenced to life in prison. He spent many of his 27 years in prison in the prison cell on Robben Island. The poem Invictus 
was a source of inspiration to Nelson Mandela during his captivity. Originally built in the late 18th century, Terezin's small fortress served as a prison for military and political opponents to the Habsburg monarchy in the early 19th century. But the most tragic part of Terezin's history came after the Czech lands were occupied by Nazi Germany. Terezin's small fortress was converted to a police prison of the Prague Gestapo in June of 1940. In November 1941, a ghetto and concentration camp for Jews was established in the large fortress and town of Terezin. At the Terezin ghetto, children were housed separately from adults and boys separately from girls. Each home had an adult supervisor who held illegal classes so the children would not be behind in their education once they were free from imprisonment. From 1942 to 1944, approximately 100 boys aged 13 to 15 lived in Building 100. These boys set up their own government and secretly produced a weekly magazine called Vadem, Czech for In the Lead. During the week, they would write poetry and create artwork. They gathered every Friday night to read aloud and share their words and their works. The writers, artists and editors put together the issues and copied them by hand behind the blackout shades of their cell block. The material was saved by one of the boys when he left Terezin. The writings reveal inspirational courage, passionate idealism and wisdom far beyond the years of their young authors. Of the 100 children in Building 100, 15 of them survived the Holocaust, and six men now in their 80s are alive today. For their Music of Remembrance series in May this year, Benaroya Hall commissioned a composer and librettist to share the story of the boys of Terezin in an oratorio. Four of the six men were at Benaroya for the concert and shared some of their experiences on the stage before the oratorio was performed. The word that kept going through my mind as I witnessed these men was resilience. When I first met Salam, I was struck by her deep, calm, steadfast presence. In my experience, people possessing this deep, radiant presence have often had to wrestle with life. Flexibility, one of the hallmarks of resilience, which we will discuss. So, resilience is not a dichotomous state. You don't have it or not have it. Resilience, we know, is a spectrum. It, um, we have certain, we have resilience in certain aspects of our lives. We have different levels of intensity of resilience, and resilience varies over time. And this is something that we will see um, exemplified by Salam. And as a precursor to what we're 
about to talk about, resilience is not just a lack of vulnerability. You'll see this in Salam's story. It's not a protection against vulnerability, and it's not simply an ability to jump back, as its etymology suggests. This is true both on the psychological level as well as the neurochemical or neuronal level. Resilience relies upon mechanisms for absorbing stress and processing it effectively. Some of the mechanisms are the neuronal circuits, some are the internal dialogues, and some are our social communities. Factors associated with resilience are mediated by genetics as well as epigenetics. The environment during development, both pre- and postnatal, temperament and random genetic mutations, the nature, number, duration of stresses, or, and the um, circumstances from which we are all relieved from stress. Neuroscience demonstrates that we, both our bodies and our minds, encode, absorb, process, and reprocess stress, trying to reach homeostasis. Allostatic load is the concept of the cumulative effects of all sources of stress, as well as the ability of the system to generate homeostasis. The more the stress, or the more inefficient or dysfunctional the systems for processing the stress, the greater the neurobiological dysregulation and the greater the psychic distress. And I'm going to see if we know. This should be plugged in, yeah? Yes, true. Salam, can you describe the communist government takeover in Ethiopia? The communist government takeover in Ethiopia around 1976, and at that time, Ethiopia was ruled by the king, King Kairos Mbasi, and they arrested and they took the power, and uh, the communist government became very revolutionary and took all people's land, all those kind of things. People start to oppose the government and start to arrest most of the high class people. And uh, start to kill the children, all those kind of things happened at that time. And it was a really, really a terrible time. Mm -hmm. Can you describe a little bit about how your family was affected during this time? My family was, uh, my dad was uh, a military colonel, and uh, they are from upper middle class. They used to have a lot of land, property, all those kind of things. And um, they start to, there was a hard time. And they start to come to the, our house. They start to arrest the children and, uh, and my father also, they took him for a few minutes and let him out. But um, and most of us are, you know, they, they gave us a very, very hard time. And out of five, seven kids, five of us was, was arrested. No, five, uh, three of us was arrested. And uh, two of them, they killed them like a uh, real massacre, like Chinese kind of thing. They killed him throw the body, but um, they didn't do for this one. We never gave back their body, we uh, never uh, buried, uh, we never buried out the two, two of them. But three of us was arrested. One was arrested for seven years and the other one arrested for four years, I mean four months. And I was in prison for nine months. And it was um, you know, a lot of torturing and um, beating the, you know, the young prisoners. Salam was 19 years old when she was taken to prison. As you heard, two of her siblings had been killed by that stage. How did they torture you, Salam? They tortured me, you know, putting was your uh, leg like this and upside down. And they put water on your uh, side part of your leg and beating you with a very rubber stick. Mm -hmm. But I always say that, you know, most of them, they will be scared and start to bring their family members 
all the their friend from the street, all those kind of things for me. I never bring anybody, but I always say that they are really picking me up, that they are picking somebody else, and I'll just tell my friend I'm watching somebody are tortured, mostly. So, finally, they stopped beating me up. And uh, I don't know why, because uh, they never get out of anything for me. And so, maybe I prayed and I said, they are not beating me up, I'm watching, you know, I feel, I feel sad looking somebody else, not me. Mm -hmm. But all my life, my life was really always swollen with water. And it was, it was a terrible time. And I'm, I'm glad it is past. So now, what do you think enabled you to be so resilient and strong during those times? I think maybe, you know, my strong religious belief and from my father also, he's a very strong loving, caring person. So he always teaches us how to be strong, how to be loving, how to be caring, how to see all people in the whole eye. So I believe I got it from my dad and uh, my my strong religious belief. I, I believe in God very much. Wherever I go, wherever I live, he's there for me. So. Mm -hmm. That's where I live, I, I believe. Mm -hmm. So my strength is from my religion and from my dad, and I still believe like God. After God, I always look over to my dad. So I'm, I'm happy I grow up in that kind of environment. My, the environment I grow up is a very loving, caring family and he's always with us and he always teach us about life so all of us are really the, all of our, the children are strong and uh, you know believe in hard work and uh, loving and caring so mm -hmm. Okay, now it's been on so long that it won't go back again. <laughs> How did they talk? Meg and I are not <laughs> very <laughs> technical. We thought we had this all sorted out yesterday when I played it. From the anecdotes about Mandela, the boys of Terezin and Salam, it is evident that, that resilience seems to involve connection to something greater than one's individual life. In our work, we look for signs of resilience. We notice loss of resilience, and we endeavor to develop and nurture it in our patients. Now we're going to switch back to Meg. It's going to continue us through her section of resilience. So the impressive thing about, one of the many impressive things about resilience is despite our bodies and our brains absorbing and having to process both intrinsic stresses, being at loss of blood volume, high blood pressure, low blood pressure, um, be it environmental factors, images, experiences, multiple studies in multiple communities across the world with diverse populations um, of individuals who've experienced all sorts of stresses have demonstrated that people tend to be resilient. Overall, again, this is across multiple studies, about a third of the community members develop symptoms of anxiety disorders or post-traumatic stress after experiencing some traumatic event. About a third develop symptoms of depression or depressive symptoms. And about a third of the population has no psychopathology whatsoever. Currently, Ugandan child soldiers are being studied a lot, um, certainly by people in my field in child and adolescent psychiatry, to try to figure out protective factors for resilience. In a study of over 200 child soldiers who were taken from northern Uganda, which is a region where spirituality and religion is very strong, similar to the general populations, almost 30% of these youth who were significantly traumatized 
abducted at a very young age, the average almost 11 years, who were heavily involved in battle, who were themselves abused emotionally, physically, and sexually, and then had to partake in abuse, almost 30% were, were resilient without any uh, psychiatric symptoms whatsoever, without any functional um, impairment. The single factor conferring twice the protection among this community um, was perceived spiritual support. And this component of temperament, along with fewer guilt and revenge cognitions, explained almost half of the variance in psychological outcomes. But we're psychiatrists, and this is an age of innovative neuroscience, so I'm going to take us back to the biology before we reintegrate into the psychiatry again. The more that is studied about resilience, the more data we have that resilience is a collection of interwoven circuits that connect microbiology with macro-social interactions. These brain regions and their associated tracts have been determined to uh, be critical in the registration, processing, and accommodation of stress, again, both from intrinsic stress signals as well as extrinsic sex stress signals. More specifically, these brain regions, their associated tracts, and the neurochemicals that run through them create stress, traumatic memories, relaxation, and acceptance. These circuits intertwine such that dysregulation in one circuit causes perturbations in multiple aspects of function, be it fear conditioning, pro-social and altruistic behaviors, reward and hopefulness, cognitive and emotional regulation, and re-regulation. What is believed is that resilience is conferred by activation and then rapid extinction of fear response, and it's not just a reduced activation of the response systems. Extinction is mediated through the same pathways that generate fear, the amygdala, the medial prefrontal cortex, the NMDA glutamatergic systems, GABAergic systems, norepinergic systems, and dopaminergic systems. Particularly important is the medial prefrontal cortex inhibition of amygdalar sensitivity. People with PTSD have decreased medial pre prefrontal cortex and increased amygdalar activity during extinction of their fear memories. In animal studies, extinction is harder to achieve. It requires more training than reconsolidation or strengthening of fear memories. Therefore, it makes sense that chemicals like decycloserine, which is an NMDA agonist, is, effective in, uh, is an effective adjunct to exposure therapy. The thalamus is important in classical or respondent conditioning. So for people like me who like simplified diagrams and an attempt at oversimplification or clarity of these interwoven circuits, um, I'm going to give you the highlights of the chemicals that are responsible for working together to activate and also to quelch the fear response. Corticotropin releasing hormone activates both anxiogenic pathways as well as anxiolytic pathways. It also has its own anxiogenic receptors, CHR1, and anxiolytic receptors, CHR2, which are located in different brain regions. CRH is one of the biggest contributors to the allostatic load. It is the primary control mechanism of fear behaviors, memory encoding, reward expectations, as well as neurovegetative symptoms. It has been demonstrated that early life stress can cause persistent elevation of CRH, and there's some evidence that an individual's response to elevated CRH in the body might be dependent on past stress as well as current social environment. Cortisol helps us focus our attention, as we've all experienced. It causes increased arousal as well as increased energy generation, and it's mediated through the amygdala control. Dihydroepiandrosterone is released synchronously with cortisol, but it has an independent homeostatic function working against cortisol to restore the long-term potentiation in the hippocampus, which is suppressed by cortisol release. It's thought to be neuroprotective, and there's some evidence that it's protective against the symptoms of dissociation and depression. The locus ceruleus norepinephrine system is activated in response to intrinsic signals, low blood volume, low blood pressure, bladder um, distension, as well as extrinsic stress signals. It stimulates the sympathetic nervous system. It inhibits the parasympathetic nervous system response. It inhibits prefrontal cortex, 
so it inhibits executive function, and it causes more limbic-driven behaviors. Persistent hyper-responsiveness of the locus ceruleus norepinergic system is associated with anxiety, intrusive memories, hypertension, cardiovascular disease. The glutamate and dopamine system drive the nucleus accumbens amygdala reward circuit that we know a lot about from addiction work, and it's the driver of hedonia, motivation, as well as optimism. Oxytocin and vasopressin are the social hormones. They're important for bonding, for socializing, for altruism, and the ability to confront and tolerate feel, fear, all important factors in developing resilience. Neuropeptide Y is important for the consolidation of fear memories and increased cognition. Of the many things we know and don't know about lithium, it's thought that lithium increases neuropeptide Y. Serotonin, like CRH, has both anxiogenic function through its 5-HT2A receptors and anxiolytic function through its 5-HT1A receptors. Cortisol inhibits 5-HT1A expression, receptor expression, um, so therefore inhibits the anxiolytic function. Fetal and early postnatal uh, inhibition of 5-HT1A expression causes irreversible anxiety tendencies in animal models. There's some evidence that decreased 5-HT1A density is present in people with depression and panic disorder, both during symptoms and after symptom remission. And there are many other chemicals that are important and currently being described um, and are involved in much more convoluted pathways that are important in these homeostatic mechanisms. So that's the neurobiological components of resilience on the surface, psychologically. These are all factors that have been associated with having resilience. Our clinical experience shows us that this web of neurobiology creates our psychological homeostasis and allostatic load. Not surprisingly, the same tendencies, the same personality traits that confer resilience in traumatic situations tend to confer resilience and ego strength in our daily lives. In fact, the big five factors of personality posited by Tupes and Crystal in 1961, openness, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism, have all been tightly associated with the factors that constitute resilience. Active coping is associated with a lower glutocorticoid response than passive coping. Intelligence is somewhat controversial. In some studies, intelligence confers resilience. In other studies, intelligence is associated with greater sensitivity, which causes a greater absorption and appreciation of the repercussions of trauma, and therefore can cause a greater allostatic load, a greater appreciation of the stress. Stress inoculation is the notion that surmountable stress experiences during youth, or a history of proven adaptive responses to stress, is more protective against future distress than an easy life. This is neurobiologic evidence of the Winnicottian notion of good enough mothering, and it also relates back to the notion that activation and effective inhibition of the fear response is more important than not generating the fear response in terms of uh, determining resilience and strengthening resilience. Everyone holds components of resilience in our brains, in our bodies, in our psyche, our social interactions, and our community. The complexity of the constituents of resilience offer opportunities for strengthening resilience even in the context of genetic susceptibility, whether that genetic susceptibility be our actual genes or our life experience. Thus, we argue that our work as psychiatrists is to help our patients uncover their resilience, nurture it, strengthen and generalize it, and help them apply it to build function. It seems fitting today that um, this is the day that we're presenting on resilience because the Dalai Lama is um, at a conference today at Stanford, his third year in a row that he's come to Stanford to um, work with investigators and researchers there. And the conference there today is on compassion and altruism, which is, um, you know, all, all three, compassion, altruism, and resilience are so similar and intertwined. For Mandela, resilience was nurtured by poetry, the boys of Terezin, writing and art. For Salam, spiritual connection to family and God, and nurturing what she received in her early years, as Meg mentioned, the good enough mother, and for her, Salam especially, the good enough father.
When resilience lies deep within, people are able to reach out and achieve beyond themselves. That altruism, engagement, standing in the face of fear and anxiety, with support and surviving, reinforces resilience and fosters the greater good. In this way, resilience is sustainable. the people who are still in Ethiopia, especially through your organization that helps aid, AIDS orphans and other orphans. What gave you the desire to want to help these people? I've been to back to Ethiopia in 1995. At that time, you know, the way, when we were in Ethiopia by the period of the king, everything was really, really good. But now the life is going down very, very worst. So when, the, when I see so many poor people, so many starved kids on the street, all those kind of things, I said, you know, I know so many people on the U.S. side. So even if I can't do by myself, I can't be a bridge. You know, the people who have money on the U.S. side can help the poor children on the Ethiopia side. So I started this organization in 2001, but I worked so hard to make it you know, to come this, to this level. So that is why, you know, at, at least I can do something because I always be lucky that the world is good people. You know, I I never been. Even if I have passed a hard time, I always have food to live, place to live, close to work. But these people, some of them even they are started when they are in their mom's stomach. And then after they are born, still they are starved and never have a single enough food for a day. So they will be born starved and die starved. So if I support one, if I take one person's life, I, I say I did something good, you know, outside of myself. Mm -hmm. So that is what my motivation is to help at least one person, you know, to make a difference. Because, you know, always we have, you know, we provide us that is something, we have to give back to others. So that's what it motivated me. But uh, I'm happy that I can see the product now. Even if it is a hard work, I'm, I'm happy you where, where we are right now. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> a poem from one of the boys of Terezin. Farewell to summer. I should like to write as you do, poets, of spring's end, of love and sunny days, of tender evenings spent in the moonlight, of birds and flowers, of trees in bud. I should like to say farewell as you who are free, with a walk in the woods, with a river and fruit, as in times of old, when we were like you are, when I was not as today, broken and forlorn. I would like to take leave of the summer as you do, in the sun stopped short by my prison grate, to fondle a fading bud for a while. I cannot, I cannot, for I live behind bars. Salah moved back to Ethiopia a few months ago to help her parents and to continue working to open a clinic for the poorest people in Addis Ababa. She also continues to run the Blue Nile Children's Organization she established many years ago to sponsor the orphans in Ethiopia she spoke about. I'd like to just acknowledge her brother Anke, who is here with us today. Thank you for coming, Anke. I would like to dedicate this grand rounds to Catherine Jimbrer, our friend and colleague. Catherine was a healer who sought and nurtured resilience in her patients. Catherine was the epitome of resilience during the four months she struggled with pancreatic cancer. 
I am grateful for what she taught me and for her work in the psychiatry department. And now, if technology allows, we would like to play something. Be a little louder. Just do you want to help me? Okay, Foray's Requiem in Paradise, and one of Catherine's favorite pieces. May we all find the time and space to nurture our own resilience, that we might have the strength to nurture it in those around us. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. So Meg and I are here to take questions, and the video stream guy told me that you get them online too, but he didn't stick around to show me how. <laughs> Maybe there's a little... Oh, no questions from the video stream. Great. <laughs> any questions from the audience? <laughs> any co any comments? Any anecdotes? Yes. I have a question when you talk about resilience and religion, and I was wondering uh, because I am a uh, practicing student of Christian Science, and I was wondering if there was any empirical studies or research done on that population of people that that um, practice that and care that. 
the Christian science philosophy. So the question is whether there's any research and empirical data on people who um, practice Christian science and resilience. And I haven't seen anything. In fact, the literature is very sparse on resilience. We had to pull from deep sources to get anything on resilience. And, uh, but just do a little search on uh, SSRIs and <laughs> you're overwhelmed. So, you know, lots more research still needs to be done and there's certainly nothing as specific as that that, I, that we found. And I think one of the, you know, the hard make? things, sure, I realize. Um, I think one of the hard things, too, is spirituality and resilience can so easily be confounded with other things like strong ego resilience, strong ego strength, strong sense of identity, a sense of altruism and doing things outside of yourself, a sense of meaning and purpose in the world, um, which Viktor Frankl has certainly acknowledged man's search for meaning is something that was really important for him and survivors of the Holocaust to tap into. And so I think it's really hard to, to pick apart, is it the certain religious tenets, or is it, um, is it the strength that having a belief and a belief in the greater good provides? Yes, Aaron. I wonder if you have any thoughts on, or anyone does, on uh, uh, books or, or other materials that are helpful to patients that you might recommend giving or not giving to them. Mm -hmm. Good question. I know <laughs> yeah. a lot for us, you know, <laughs> tapped into that. Um, I've been torn about whether to recommend yeah. a book that has a, you know, that can be either too spiritual or not spiritual enough for a given patient. I think exploring with the patient where they are with their spirituality or their whatever belief system they believe in and then trying to resonate with that. Um, you know, just personally with Catherine, the two things that Catherine felt really resonated for her were drumming and toning. And so that's what we did. You know, we did healing circles with Catherine and we drummed and we toned and we, and we read poetry. And and it's, you know, it nurtured her resilience. And so I think our task as, um, as we work with people is to really tap into what resonates for them. It may be spirituality. It may be various other things. Yes, Mick. A couple things. One, the activation of the fear response is a good thing. We all really knew that, but I think to have that highlighted really was essential. So much of what we're doing is trying to get people to practice, whether it's motivation reviewing or uh, helping uh, prepare for a grand round or joining a soccer team if you're 11 years old and you're kind of goofy. Mm -hmm. Practicing the fear response is, we know this about mm -hmm. adaptation. The, the, the phrase I still am about something good beyond myself, that's also, there's a, it's just fascinating. I'd love to see MRIs. <laughs> <laughs> have somebody thinking, it could be that, you know, when the kids they work with the state hospital, but somebody's thinking about this or doing it, either way, mm -hmm. you can't really do it and get the MRI. But mm -hmm. I, I think there is something that we're all trying to shape our patients towards, which is something good beyond themselves. And of, of course, spirituality and cultural affiliation and soccer teams or whatever, I mean, I mean affiliation plays into that. Mm -hmm. But I think it's just um, fascinating to look at somebody doing an MRI study where you're helping people imagine doing something good. Because um, it, it seems to get at that wonderful labyrinthine neurotransmitter you know, grid that you guys are showing. There's this lovely image in one of the studies um, that I was reading looking at what is associated with resilience, Mick, and it, um, it, it put a, a lovely image in my mind, and this is the notion that people, this is done a, uh, a lot in the military among the, the high-end SEALs or Rangers or all the really um, high-level technical uh, soldiers, as well as their partners. And this notion of being able to confront fear and then handle it effectively, to be able to still be productive and highly functional in the face of fear, of, experiencing a feeling of fear response is, you know, is, is exposure therapy. And one of, the, one of the things that one of the studies found was that having someone with you, partners, a husband and a wife, this, this is a heterosexual community, holding each other's hands, merely holding your husband or wife's hand was enough to dampen down and extinguish that fear response. And I'm sure 
they didn't do MRIs, but I, you know, we know what it looks like. And, and that, I think, is a lovely metaphor that, that we as psychiatrists and we as mental health practitioners um, have the access to do. You know, maybe because of boundaries we don't hold hands, maybe because of boundaries we do put our hand on someone, but mm -hmm. proverb proverbially um, we get to be there with someone mm -hmm. and, and um, help them confront and respond to fear. Meg, you've just answered the question that did, came, that did come oh. in from Karen at Fred Hutch. Can resilience be taught, and if so, do you think it is mainly through exposure, or are you just dis discussing, as you're just discussing, or are there other strategies that might be effective? Yeah. So holding their hands and helping them through it. You know, I don't think it's a taught thing. There was I think a it's a joint, you know. Exactly. There was yeah. a study, a twin study on resilience, of all things, in, golly, I think it was um, Denmark, um, so I don't know what the confounders are, but they found that temperament, genetic temperament, accounts for only about 10% of the variance in uh, resilience. So there's 90% of things that we have the opportunity to intervene on. Exciting. Yeah. <laughs> That's cool to get questions from over. I know. Wow. <laughs> it's like an invisible audience. <laughs> Had I known, I would have been a lot more nervous. <laughs> All right, anything else? Any other comments, anecdotes? Okay, thank you very much for coming and sharing this time and space with us.